Hi, I'm Robbie Rogers of the LA Galaxy, and you're watching Behind the Brand. Hi, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with pro athlete and author Robbie Rogers. Robbie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, talk to us about your story. How did you get okay. here? You know, everyone knows you probably from the Galaxy and... Yeah, I mean, I started playing professional soccer when I was 18, 19, you know, after a year at University of Maryland. And um, I don't know, I've just always been a fan of soccer. You know, I, I remember watching the first World Cup in the United States in 94. It was a Columbia-US game, the Rose Bowl. And that kind of sparked my interest in being a soccer player. I think I was seven or eight years old. And uh, I think from that moment, I thought, like, you know, I want to be in the World Cup one day. So I ch started to take those steps, and I kind of had those role models and, and eventually you know, found my place in professional sports. Talk to us about what it's like to play in the professional league. You know, a lot of people watch this show. They're entrepreneurs. They've got yeah. a startup. And I think there's a great metaphor, you know, with sports and business, you know. Um, both have their difficult moments, you know. Yeah. Both, there's a lot of rejection. There's, you know, sometimes a lot of blood and sweat, you know. Talk to us about what it's like to play professional ball. Um, I think like in any business, and if you want to be good at anything, there's a lot of sacrifice. And uh, that was extremely t difficult for me when I was younger. You know, you had to give up your weekends, uh, a lot of your nights. You know, you go to training every day, and uh, you, f you sacrifice so much. So for me, I loved it so much, so it didn't feel like that. You know, I, I wanted to be successful. It didn't feel like I was giving up, you know, going to school dances. Or, mm -hmm. or, or you know, when I had to live in Florida, I didn't, I didn't feel like I was giving up my high school, high school experience. So um, I just absolutely loved it. And I did everything in my power to become a professional athlete. You know, I would train extra. I would, um, you know, watch soccer on TV. I, uh, you know, summer breaks would go over to Europe and train with teams. Um, and I was, I was really lucky and blessed to have people around me that really helped me great coaches and, and my family was very supportive um, but you know I think with professional sports and I think why a lot of men and women in professional sports are so successful in businesses after their their career in sports is because of that drive and passion to be successful and to you know give up sacrifice or to sacrifice things like I said earlier um, and also there's just a drive to be good at things, you know, very competitive. So that's one of the things that drives me to do things outside of sports. Yeah, so where does that drive come from? Is it something you're born with or <laughs> uh, can it be learned? I, I think it can be learned. Uh, for me, it definitely was born with them from a family of five kids. So I was competing with everyone in my family for attention and for all of that stuff. The uh, last hamburger. Exactly. You know, you have to eat three hamburgers before your brother gets, you know, finishes his first one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... You know, I think from a very young age, and if you ask anyone in my family, I was a very competitive person. But I, I think you can learn that. I think uh, if you want to be successful in anything, you have to be competitive. You know, you have to be driven. And again, it goes back to sacrificing things. So, um, yeah, I was lucky to, to kind of be raised that way. But I'm sure, you know, it's something that you can learn. So how do you learn it then? I mean, how do people ask you, you know, yeah. how did you get this level of success? How did you make yeah. it? You know, younger kids probably are looking at you as as their idol and trying to model so, what you're doing? Like, what, what advice do you give them? That's a good question. I think the most important thing is to find something that you're passionate about. You know, find something you're passionate about and and then to create a plan, you know, how you're going to get there, how you're going to get to that goal. And I think when you create those little steps, you become almost competitive, just naturally become competitive. You want to get to that next step and get to the next step and eventually find yourself at your goal. So yeah. you now it's a little different. Um, I know for me, when I was younger, I was like, all right, I want to get to the U17 national team. I want to get to U18 and to the U20 World Cup. It's so you set milestones. Yeah, I set milestones, set little goals like that. And, and Were they little by little or did you set like the end goal? Like, I definitely want to make the national team. That's the peak of the mountain, but I know I need to take well, I watched those guys, you know, when I was, when I told you I moved to Florida to play in residency, and I watched those guys, so I watched Landon Donovan and DeMarcus Beasley and those guys play, and they'd come train. So I always said, like, oh, one day I want to be at that level. Yeah. And even when I watched the World Cup when I was younger, you know, I wanted to be at that level. But I was very much in the moment of, okay, I need to make the U17 World Cup, and, and, and you know, I need to turn pro. So I don't know why, but when I was probably like 16 or 17, I was like, I, I need to be... I need to turn pro while I'm a teenager. I don't know why I thought this, but I was like, I need to do it. So I turned pro actually when I was, I think like just when I was turning 19, when I moved to Holland to play for Heronvane. Yeah. And I don't know why, but I like set that that goal and I had that intention and I just like willed myself and, and I found myself playing in, in Europe. You know? Yeah, I, th I think that's a really excellent message. And I, I, it's subtle because I, I want to underscore it a little bit. It's like, it sounds like you had the end goal in mind. You didn't mind doing those little steps in between the benchmark, but 
you were so determined to knock those out, like yeah. cross it off your list or get there at any cost that you just kept your eyes on the prize. Yeah, I, I honestly believe that when you want something so badly, I feel like the universe like helps, and you work hard, I feel like the universe like helps you get to it. And I know that was the case for me in a, in a lot of different, or a lot of different points in my life and going to Europe and then playing in England, I was like, yeah, I want to play in England at some point in my career. So, well, you also painted yourself into, you know, you gave yourself a deadline. Yeah. You said, I, before I'm not a teenager, or yeah, yeah. while I'm a teenager, <laughs> like a I want to go pro. But, you know, yeah. I think that's an important lesson per perhaps we can pull from this is uh -huh. you have to stretch yourself or push yourself yeah. and create the specific, okay, you know, next Tuesday I will ship this or else. Yeah, of course. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I do that at the beginning of every year. And I'm sure a lot of people do, and it's kind of cheesy, but, you know, last year I... I remember was talking to my ex-boyfriend and, and we spoke about like you know what kind of stuff do I want to do with the galaxy this year and you know definitely a championship was one of those things more playing time please yeah yeah exactly and, and Kills so me. I kind of reinvent myself and and um so you know there were things that was like okay that's a huge goal and, and the way that the season ended the year before it was you know not that likely but uh we, our team and and I think myself being part of it, we kind of just willed our, our way to it, and, and there were yeah. so many different obstacles we had to overcome, but just to kind of put that on the universe and, and to have that goal, um, I don't know, it really helped me, and at the end of the year, I saw, like, okay, and I was looking at my goals, and I was like, wow, like, it was pretty amazing. I, you know, p sold the show and the championship and really reinvented myself in the field and uh, a number of different things, so. Um, I have a question. Uh, so how do you get people on board who you want to be on board because you need your team. Yeah. I mean, you, you play team sport. Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with yourself. You know, you show up every day. I show up early every day, and I go in and lift weights and and just I'm a professional. I think um, you know your actions speak louder than words. And and I'm the one. I'm the kind of guy that on the field, of course, sometimes you'll hear me. You know, get angry, but uh, I'd rather um, be the guy running and doing fitness and working my butt off and kind of leading that way. Yeah. So. Uh, the guys buy into that. When you're in a locker room and you're talking, 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 or at least for me, I, I turn away from that kind of stuff. So if you're working hard and you're captain to the guys that are, you know, good guys that are leading, but uh, also, you know, the first guys there and the last guys to leave, teams, your team buys into that. Yeah. And our team, uh, we became like a family this year. And it took a while, but at the end of the season, there was no chance that we were going to lose, you know, the championship game. Are there some that still don't quite catch the vision and they end up on the fringes? I mean, it sounds like you're, remember that football movie, Rudy? Yeah. You're like Rudy, like working his guts out, trying his very best. Are there people that <laughs> you have to sort of drag, you uh, know, on board? And I ask that because, yeah. you know, if you're running a company or organization, yeah. and especially if you're at the top, yeah. you know, you're, you're somewhat privileged, right? And um, uh, author Seth Godin talks about, you know, chefs, cooks, and bottle washers, you know? Yeah. The chefs are in charge, the bottle washers are disrespected. Yeah. Uh, so in your industry, you know, it's yeah. the guys that are lower on the totem pole, younger, maybe sitting on the bench, uh, or maybe it's the older players that are jaded and, you know, they're just collecting a paycheck. Yeah. How, how do you get people on board besides, yeah. you know, just sheer, I'm gonna show you by example? Like, well, first off, in sports, there's such a fine line, and if you have a number of those guys, you're not going to succeed, and you're not going to win a championship. Or do they get weeded out? Do they get traded? Or? Yeah, they get weeded out, but it's it's not usually that season. You know, it takes you know you wait to the off season, you trade guys, you sell guys, or guys just don't get their contracts picked up. Do they get shunned by the team? It's like, hey, that no, guy's not. No, I th it, I, in sports, or at least in my sport, guys are really professional, and if if it's happening a lot, definitely the captains will go speak with them. But um, I've never been on a championship team that has. You know, a large number of those guys, and maybe some of the younger guys that don't really know how to be a pro yet, and you expect that sometimes. Yeah. So that's when you kind of you bring them along, but in a very sensitive way, and you talk to them about your experiences and and when you were a rookie, and you know, having to carry the balls out, or when you're traveling to do the bags and stuff like that. But um, again, I'm a person that you know, of course, I like to share my experiences, and that's the way I teach, kind of. So when I was coming out, people have asked me, like, oh, how did you come out and then go back into sports? And I never try to give people advice, but I'll just talk to them about my experience. So I yeah. do the same in, in sports. With the older guys, the veteran guys, if you have a large number of those guys, you're not going to win a championship. You know? And that's up to the coach. The coach is the one that, that builds the locker room, that builds the mentality. And and uh, when you have guys like that, you're just not going to be successful. So anytime I've been anytime I've been on a team like that, uh, it's extremely difficult, especially because now I'm starting to become one of the veterans. I'm 27, and I know in sports it's like starting to get old. But uh, as a young guy, when we had older guys like that, 
it was tough for me and I would just just work. I would just continue to work and try to um, contribute more on the field. But you're not going to be successful. So uh, that's when it's up to the coaches and the captains to kind of speak to those guys. And so I guess if you're running a business, you know, those are difficult conversations that you'll have to have. But uh, I'm not at that point in my life yet. Well, it sounds like another good message is empathy. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people have either scold them, try, try to get them out. But yeah. it sounds like you handle leadership with empathy too. Like, yeah. I was there once, yeah, I carried the balls, you know, I yeah. paid my dues. Yeah, and I remember my rookie year, um, you know, it was difficult. I was lucky because I was preparing for U20 World Cup, so I had that goal to, you know, get to and to try to uh, win a World Cup for the U.S. at the, the Olympics in Canada, or sorry, the World Cup in Canada. So it was a little different for me, but I remember having to carry balls and having to stay after, and if we didn't stay after, the coaches saying stuff just like, why aren't you guys staying after training? You guys are, you know, 19, 20 years old, you should be training more. Yeah. Um, so I remember that stuff. Yeah, I remember that stuff. And I remember being annoyed sometimes, like, well, I can't walk. My legs are dead. You know, I'm so sore. <laughs> yeah. But so I, I just try to, you know, like you said, just be sensitive and, and empathize with what, you know, how they're feeling and what they're going through and and uh, and joke with them as well because, you know, no one wants to just always be criticized, I don't think. I, I think empathy is huge. And, and maybe it's uh, a trait that's very much underrated and appreciated. Talk a little bit about... Uh, empathy, you know, for those who haven't heard your story about coming out, you've got the new yeah. book. I want to talk about that in a little bit, but yeah. talk about the, you know, the the time leading up to that. Yeah. Sort of the time when you maybe thought all was lost. Yeah, yeah. And then how it completely yeah, of course. changed directions. Yeah, so I have a, such like a love hate relationship with sports because, uh, you know, I grew up always wanting to be a professional athlete, but when I was 14, 15, I realized I was gay. And I didn't have any role models to look up to. I didn't have anyone to kind of mold my career after. I, uh, you know, thought that it wasn't possible to be gay and to be a professional athlete. So I really struggled with it and was very isolated and depressed. And even when I was went to University of Maryland and then went over to Holland, and, and, and nobody knew. Nobody knew. No, not I, even I, your parents. No, not even. My, no, I mean, no one knew, especially yeah. not my parents. <laughs> um, but I. Uh, was just struggling, and it was a way that I had to deal with it. I struggled with it myself, and had to kind of come to terms with myself before I could tell anyone else. But um, yeah, there was definitely points in my life where I was just so alone and depressed, and people thought, "Oh, he's a professional athlete. He's going to Olympics. He's doing this kind of stuff. He should be so happy." But I realized that you know through those accomplishments, because you know, I thought that would kind of mask you know my depression and yeah. my isolation. What did it feel like though? You felt completely alone, like unsupported, or uh, it felt like just completely. I was just completely alone. It felt like uh, no one in the world really knows who I am. Um, uh, and if they did, then I probably wouldn't have any kind of support. You know, I felt like I got uh, love and attention from being a, a successful athlete. So uh, it was really difficult. And So did you, you sort of, I mean, it almost sounds like you sort of uh, pre-sabotaged uh, pre it. Like you made it fail before anyone else made it fail. Because maybe you were afraid. Yeah, it's 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 talk about that a little bit. It's the thing. It's the amount of things that you hear from your family, from yeah. things in the locker room, uh, in stadiums, from commentators about like homophobic things. Like how could like I'd be in a locker room and someone would say, uh, "Guys, we'd be riding the bike after a game," and people would have a discussion of how could someone even be gay? How could a guy go through the act of loving their man? How like how disgusting is that? And I'd be sitting over there riding the bike, yeah. hearing this kind of stuff, thinking, "Well, wow, like I am never going to come out while I'm playing professional soccer." And are you even sure that they weren't gay? I mean, no. I mean, I, I, those are the same guys that sent me messages and texted me after I came out and were like, "Oh, Robbie, I, like loved having you as a teammate and uh, respect you so much." So, yeah. um, so it's, it's just a, it's, a it's lack it's of mental, understanding. It's lack of understanding. Yeah, it's uh, uh, or insensitivity. Men, yeah, insensitivity. It's the it's the locker mentality where guys say things that they want other people. They think other people want to hear. They say things that. Uh, fit a stereotype of what a professional athlete is, which, yeah. you know, professional athletes are also different from different religions, and there's a number of gay guys out there that are closeted. And um, So we, are you officially the first professional athlete to come out? No. Uh, there's been uh, a few guys in the past. That, like I know there's a baseball player, there's Glenn Bergen, he played for the, a the A's and the Dodgers maybe, and a few other clubs. I could have that name wrong, so don't quote me. But he was kind of out and reporters just wouldn't write about it. And he would talk about it, but people wouldn't write about it. So it was maybe not when it was relevant or... As... Yeah, or just when it was just so taboo that if they knew they wrote about it, that they'd probably lose their jobs and yeah. that there would be a huge uproar. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's female athletes that have come out, you know, Abby Wambach, Megan Rapinoe, uh, 
uh, there was a boxer, I forgot his name, but uh, you know, in I guess modern sports, it's myself, Jason Collins, and Michael Sam. Um, so it's crazy that things haven't changed more quickly, and that you know, after seeing the experience that we've had, and I've become friends with all three or all, both those guys, uh, it's strange that more people haven't kind of taken that step. But then it reminds me of of the culture that I was in before I came out and the things that I heard and, and the the mentality that, that guys have towards uh, gay men and women. You got to a point where you just said, I can't do this. Yeah. yeah. And what was that about? Uh, I was, I moved to England and um, I moved to England. It was one of my goals. It was one of my dreams to play in England. And, and at that point I played like 20 times for the national team and went to the Olympics and won different championships. And I realized I wasn't happy. And I was like, well, none of this stuff is making me happy. So like, what kind of change do I need to make? And I, I was raised and I believe, and I believed that time that I was a person that if something was really bothering me that much and I was so depressed and I didn't want to be the, one of those people that was al always thinking about always constantly nagging myself I didn't want to be a person that then didn't make a change yeah so let's say I was at a I don't know I had I was at a club and it was an awful situation with a coach I didn't want to be there two three years and always be complaining about it to myself and to my agent I wasn't like okay well what what's what am I gonna how am I gonna fix this get it out in the open exactly I need to change this I need to uh, be in a positive environment I need to move forward and so it, got to the, it took 25 years, but <laughs> it got to the point where I was like, okay, I need to make a change. And if this means I need to step away from the sport that I grew up loving and sacrificed so much for, then that's what I need to do. So um, I made a plan, and, and that's what I did. And then what happened? Uh, came out to my family first, and um, I'm from a very conservative Catholic family, and they were very supportive. You know, I told you earlier, but my mom, you know, she was so supportive. She brought me to tears, and, and it's really the, the only time that I've, that I've really cried during this whole thing, except when I watched uh, that Alec, Alan Turing movie, uh, Imitation Games. <laughs> I was, was pretty sad for that. But um, everyone supported me. And I, I told you, like the same people that I heard the most ridiculous homophobic things from were the same people that called me and, and uh, supported me. And and, it, and I, it was a lesson that I learned. You know, you have to give people really a chance to get to know you and to really to love you and to kind of surprise you. And, to, and uh, it was those people that really supported me that got me back into soccer. What does your mom mean to you? I mean, how has she influenced your life? And yeah, uh, talk about your relationship a little bit. Yeah, my mom. Um, you know, she, my mom and my dad, but my mom, especially, I have a special bond with her, and I think everyone in my family would kind of say that I was a mama's boy, which mm -hmm. is which is true. <laughs> I was there the other day. My mom had shoulder surgery, so I went down and stayed in Huntington Beach a few days and just like you know cooked meals for her and took care of her. Um, but she is a very strong woman. She uh, she's a lawyer, but she you know, with my dad raised five kids, mm -hmm. and, and um, I don't know. She's just a very strong individual that supported me and would you know with my dad drive me to training and take me when we'd have to fly to Philadelphia for soccer tournaments and and then would make sure every day that uh, you know all five of her kids were you know getting their homework done and all that stuff. So. I'm sure there's a lot of moms out there that are that are, are like that and, and really struggle and, and have to go through a lot to raise five kids. But for me, I, I just felt like she was the best mom in the world that, that always supported me. And when I came out, which I was, I thought it was so difficult for me to come out to her, and she was one of the first people I did. You thought it would just devastate her? I thought her. it was, a, yeah, I thought that she would then think of me differently. And that you she disappoint would, them or something? Yeah, disappoint, disappoint her. And she, from the second I told her, just was like, you know, Robbie, I love you so much. This doesn't, this doesn't mean anything. You know, I, I just want to support you. So, like, what's the next step? How can I help you? And then my mom was a church. She, she speaks at Mass. She goes to church every day. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, a huge concern of mine. But uh, eventually when I moved back here from London, I remember, like, having, she was talking to me about, like, marriage and, like, marriage equality stuff. And then everything just passed in the Supreme Court and in California. And uh, I, I was speaking to her, like, you know, how do you feel about that kind of stuff? And she's like, oh, I can't wait to go to your, to your wedding. And, and when I was younger, you know, I would hear her speak about same-sex marriage. It's like how, how awful it was. And so it took an experience, like, that was so personal. And her son to, you know, to come out to kind of just, like, it, it was like overnight she changed. But just to have an open mind and to, yeah. which I think is rare for somebody. I think sometimes people get to, you know, she's, she's older now and six years old. And I think sometimes people get to that point and, are kind of set in their ways, but yeah. she you know, adapted and had an open mind and, and, and loved me and and uh, has but been you know very what? supportive. I think that's it's because I'm a parent. Yeah, I think it's really intuitive. Yeah, flesh and blood, you I, know. Yeah, I agree with you, but I have 
tons of friends, gay men, that don't speak to their families. And I receive yeah. letters from kids all around the world every day that uh, are abandoned by their families when they come out. Yeah. So, and it's 2015, you know, uh, you can't get married in every state here in the United States. Yeah. So I agree with you, and that's experience that I had with my family. But uh, sometimes it's good to get those reminders from those people because you realize, like, okay, well, I'm happy that I'm able to have a public platform where I can help people and play a sport that I love, but also be a role model for people that I didn't have and the people that are abandoned by their families or that aren't loved by, you know, people close to them, that they uh, at least can kind of see what I'm doing so they can have a role model to, I don't know, not not exactly stretch their life after, but at least see what I did right and what I did wrong. Well, you're right back to empathy, aren't you? Yeah, yeah I think that's uh, something I think I learned from my mom from a very young age. So, uh, you so you wrote this new book, or yeah. um, uh, talk to us about the project. Who'd you write it for, and, yeah. and what's it about? Uh, so I, I wrote the book with Penguin, coming out to play with Eric Marcus, um, and I did it mainly because of the response I had from people after I posted my letter publicly. So that was about four months after I came out to my family. I posted a letter while I was living in England, just a social media. I think I titled it like "Getting Some Shit Off My Chest" or something <laughs> like that. You tweeted out or something? Yeah, I tweeted out or put it on my blog. It was kind of to my face. I don't know, something like that. Uh, closed my laptop, like <laughs> turned off my phone, and I didn't know what the response was going to be. I thought, you know, there'd be some articles written, but I didn't think. You know, I was ready to go back to London College of Fashion. I was done with soccer. I, I thought, you know, okay, that's it. Uh, but it was the uh, letters I received and emails and phone calls from you know thousands and thousands of people around the world that really inspired me. Like, okay, it would be pretty amazing if I could go into more detail and kind of tell the whole story. And yeah. and also like, what a great learning experience to learn how to write a book and to work with a writer and with the agent and with the publishing house and then do uh, you know a PR plan and then to have to do the book tour. And there were so many things that really excited me about the book. Yeah. So um, well, books are amazing, right? They, they yeah. can. Um, get under your skin and it's something you can give to someone and they can yeah. hold, they can download yeah. on a device, but you know, it's like that whole crowd, you know, some people are watching the action, other people like yeah. to read it yeah. and it can really make change. Yeah, and and uh, it was very therapeutic for me to write. You know, I had to go through all those experiences that I had when I was younger and to bring those all up and Eric came and stayed with me for a few months and we just would write, write, write and um, then when it was done, <laughs> you, when you work on something so much, you become so passionate about it, you you become more, you, you think it's great, of course, you know, and you send it to the editors and they make notes and everyone makes notes and people close to you read it and everyone's, oh, this is great. But yeah. then once you finally publish it and you, you have your, your audience is, is there to read it and you get that reaction, that's when, you know, you, you really learn if, if it touches people and, and if it uh, is going to help people. And yeah. so um, I wrote it not just for gay men and women and not just for athletes, but I wanted to be able to reach people in middle America that maybe had, uh, uh, were a bit homophobic or, or had someone in their family that, moved, that was gay. That, that just uneducated uh, about the whole yeah, exactly. thing. Just people that were maybe a little bit ignorant. And, and I think it has. I think it's, it's, it has a large appeal than just a sports community or just a gay community. Um, and you know, I've heard from, from people uh, from all around the world, actually, that have, have picked up the book and have, have really have said to me, like, Robbie, I felt like you were writing my story. Like, I realize it's yours, but, like, there was so much in the book that I connected to. So that was, you know, that was our goal for Eric and I, and, and uh, we're really happy with the way it's turned out. Um, and well, it's just the beginning, I think. You know, it's only been two months. So you had phenomenal success, but talk a little bit about some of your failures, some of the okay. rejection, yeah. and, and talk about it, I guess, from hindsight, because everyone wants to know the secret sauce, you know. Yeah. What should I do to avoid the pain and the frustration. Yeah. How do you deal with rejection and all that? Yeah, and when you mentioned that to me earlier, I honestly, I don't think there's a special sauce for everyone. I think it's so different for everybody. Um, for me, definitely for my failures or... or um, what have you failed at? I didn't make the Olympic qualifying team was like the first huge failure, or at least I felt like it was a failure. Um, so that was tough, you know, and... and and I, I took it more, I motivated myself. So I didn't make the Olympic qualifying team. Coach obviously told me, and and that next season I was an all-star, I was best 11, and we won the championship in Columbus. And it really just motivated me to like prove people wrong. Yeah. And it, on a smaller scale, when let's say at the beginning of a game, I lose a ball or I get a tackle or there's a foul or my coach starts yelling at me, you'll usually see, and my coach knows this because I know he uses it <laughs> with me a lot, I'll have a great game after that, or I'll be much more aggressive, or I'll make yeah. sure, or, you know, so there's little things like that, or I'll watch a video, you know, of a game, 
and I'll see my mistakes. And the next game, it's like I'll, it really, I, I improve that way. So to be able to notice, I think that's the skill to have, is to realize when you've failed, but not to take it as a failure, but to learn, learn from it as a learning experience. That's when I've improved the most from it. So even when doing stuff for the book tour and seeing like friends sending me interviews that I've done and be like, oh, that doesn't make sense. Why did I say that? And then do the next interview and, and trying to at least, because you know you get that chance to, to, to reach out to people and to you know, send a message, so it's important. So I would take that interview, see what I did right and wrong, and go to the next one and improve on that. So that's in all aspects of my life, sports or with the book, with writing, uh, with the show stuff, with you know, working with writers, and then realizing like, oh, I, I, I wish I would have been more of a voice for these writers so that the notes could have been implemented in a different way. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think also I don't ever regret anything. So when I didn't make the Olympic team, when I didn't make the World Cup team and I got cut, I was an alternate and I got cut in the, the last cut, um, I just realized the work that I put in and, and the process that it took me to get there and, and how proud I was of myself. I remember we put in, I think it was Czech Republic or Croatia the day before I got cut and I had a great, I had a really great game and, and I still got cut. And so <laughs> there's some stuff you can't do, but it still motivated me the next season and, and the season after that and, and, and now, you know, when I get back to the national team. So I, I remember those those failures, I guess, if you want to call them, and, and they just, I learn from them and, and they motivate me. But I think it's, it's different for everyone, you know. It, it, it's, it's tough to kind of, I don't know, create a special sauce, like you said. <laughs> We've been spending a few minutes with professional athlete and author Robbie Rogers. Robbie, thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me.